uh, Professor Henry Alinitwe to give his remarks at this momentous occasion. Professor Alinitwe. Thank you very much, my colleague, uh, Professor Zahara Nampel, the Deputy Principal of the School of Law, the Director Huri Peck, the keynote speaker, Mr. Opio, uh, Professor Loka, the representative of the Justice Law Order Sectors and Institutions, representatives from the diplomatic missions in Uganda, representatives from the civil society organizations, the media, fraternity, colleagues from the School of Law and other uh, units of McKinney University, our very dear students here at the School of Law and those from outside the school, uh, and I should also say all protocol observed, just in case. Uh, I've already been introduced. My name is Henry Lin Itwe, and I'm in the office of the Deputy Vice Chancellor in charge of Finance and Administration. I thank you for inviting the Vice Chancellor, but the Vice Chancellor has chosen to delegate to me to, get, to, to allow me to come and represent him because of uh, another equally important engagement. So that's why you see a relatively new face. Uh, I want to start by congratulating uh, Huri Peck uh, for celebrating the 30 years. It's not a mean achievement. I think you just clap for that. <laughs> and of course, here, this is where we recognize the people who have worked in Huri Peck over those many years, including, of course, Professor Onyango Loka, uh, those of uh, Prof Dr. Zahara Nampeo, Dr. Rose Nakai, uh, Mr. Sam Tindifa, Professor Kidu Makubia, all those uh, contributed diligently to this institution of Huripec. So therefore, we take note of that and we thank uh, them for the service, invaluable service. As a university, we are very proud of uh, the School of Law and of course, Hewlett Peck, for the contribution that you make, uh, not just to Makerere, but to the entire country. Uh, Professor Loka has already talked about the impact that Hewlett Peck has made in the various sectors, but also the very many products of the School of Law who are serving in different capacities, including the justices, uh, the magistrates, the very many cadres in the law and other sector, but also many others who contribute uh, to be able to make this society uh, peaceful and enjoy the human rights. Uh, of course, as academics, I know the, I, I've seen the write-up, the, the concept which talks about the key areas of focus, one of them is peace, uh, Peace is very important to all of us, all human beings. Uh, if you don't know the importance of peace, you watch the, 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 the screens on TV and you see the fighting in the Middle East, Israel versus Palestine or Gaza Strip. And that's when you realize that peace is very important. It's very important to all of us as human beings, but also it's elusive in a way. And it started way back when I think God created us and put Adam and Eve in the garden and somehow they misbehaved. From there on, peace also disappeared. Well, they started telling lies and, and so on and so forth. The issue of human rights, uh, my colleague Dr. Zahra Nampe has talked a lot about it. And, and you can see that in a way it's all encompassing. She brought in the aspect of uh, potholes as part of <laughs> of the requirements for human rights. So if you look at it from that angle, then almost everything uh, becomes uh, part of the human rights regime. You know, access to good education, access to clean air, 
Uh, you know, there are many people who are polluting our environment, even the noise. I mean, we are here, but I'm sure you can, hear, you can still hear the noise from the Lord just adjacent. I think that's also part of the human rights. We should be in a very quiet, conducive environment for teaching and learning. Uh, social justice is also uh, key in the, in the concept that we should all have social justice. But also what struck me most in the concept note is the issue of the organic, resilient, and popular constitution. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Kabumba, and I was wondering whether we're going to drive on this one too much today or it's a long-term goal. Uh, and, and also, I was wondering whether we have the mandate to, to, to delve so much into this and come up with the, it was, I think the, the issue is, the deliverable is a draft constitution. So it means that we must be able to engage widely and come up with a document that can be relied on and tabled to the relevant, uh, I mean, the organs that have got the mandate to review uh, and, and pass the constitution. So, but anyway, it's a very good uh, and ambitious program. And I want to this opportunity to congratulate you on that idea. Uh, so that we're, in, the, in a few years time, we were able to have uh, you know, a much better Uganda, much better place. Uh, I want to, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, also use this opportunity to congratulate Huey Peck for the wide impact in terms of the uh, publications and contributions to the body of knowledge. I know there have been many publications in terms of research journals, working papers, policy briefs, uh, several books on human rights, uh, and also the East African Journal of Peace and Human Rights for the sustenance and also the contribution made in those various areas. McKay University, as I said, uh, is proud of the School of Law, and uh, over the last few years, there have been significant improvements. I'm sure those of you who have been around a little longer than four years, you can obviously see the improvements. We have got a new building. I think we need to clap for the university. We need to clap for the government of Uganda for the enormous support, and we hope that that will also improve. It's also part of the human rights uh, Dr. Zahar Nampeo, that lecturers and professors sit in a comfortable environment where they can sit and digest and, uh, and interact with their students so they are able to, you know, nurture them well. Uh, the university has also benefited in terms of, um, you know, remuneration for lecturers or different cadres of staff at the university. And again, that's also part of the human rights that we are able to get better salaries than they were before. And we pray that the government uh, and the Ministry of Education and Sports uh, keeps on with that pace. I don't, I don't want to take too long. Uh, mine is, was to thank Huri Peck and of course to, to, to welcome the other stakeholders and to say that the university is happy with these events where students engage with the staff and other stakeholders, and learn in the process. Uh, Professor Oloka was saying in 1979 and 1981, and I was imagining even that possibly even the current director of Uripec was not yet born. <laughs> so I think you clap for him. You clap for the <laughs> clap for him. Uh, that now he has matured. He can now sit at the table with the men like Professor Oloka and discuss these things, uh, it's quite amazing how time can fly. Um, so with those few remarks, I want to wish you a nice uh, occasion of uh, 30 years, and should I say then, happy birthday, Huri Peck. Thank you.
Thank you so much for those remarks. Um, I think we shall move to the keynote address um, at this moment to invite our guest to give uh, the keynote address and uh, to bring him up, I'll, Dr. Sinje Kavumba will give the introduction and welcome him. Thank you. Thank you again, Geoffrey, and uh, thanks, uh, Professor Henry Ainitwe, uh, Professor Loko Nyango, Dr. Zahara, for setting us off very strongly. Professor Henry is right, of course. Last week we were at another forum, and he disclosed to the, it, it was the swearing in of the new university council, and, and he disclosed to the colleagues there that he's actually uh, the brother of the late Professor Katorowo who was a very, very dear friend of my, my late Mzei. Um, and so it, it's true that uh, while some of us were in nappies and crawling around, our elders were making significant contributions. It's, it's, for me, that sets our discussion today in, a very, in another light about, about the cycle, about generations. And it also casts you, uh, our dear students, in, in, in terms of being able to, to know, I, I know the challenge of course in Uganda is that we've always been promised that we are the leaders, uh, we're the leaders of tomorrow and at the national level, <laughs> tomorrow has never come. Luckily in Huripek, we also have the example of tomorrow coming. We have, we have directors, emeriti, we have previous directors at Huripek, um, which we don't have at this, stage, at this stage at the national level. So I think for me, that's also something quite quite interesting. Now, I will speak more to the, the vision for the next five years in terms of the broad agenda that UREPEC has under the Reconstituting Uganda project, um, which uh, uh, Professor Unito spoke a bit to in terms of if the state is unwilling to carry out meaningful constitutional reforms, then it seems it's the mandate of all citizens as contemplated under Article 3, Clause 4, to do precisely that. And, and it's, it's, it's in, in some ways in that sense that we are very privileged to have with us um, a gentleman who really needs no introduction, um, Nicolas Opio, a, an award-winning human rights crusader. Were you alive in 79? <laughs> but definitely at 1990, in 1993 when Hurebeck was born, you were, you were alive. The idea behind reconstituting Uganda is, is informed by the national crisis in which we find ourselves. The, the fact that the Uganda that, we, that is claimed might exist in law, but every day we are reminded that whether it exists in fact, is a whole different thing. Whether it was for the, the Bafuruchi that came up when we were at law school, or the recent Bala law that is now coming up, or just yesterday, I think, the Baruli, uh, 10 square miles at Makere University, has land that was earmarked for it somewhere in Nakasogola, and it turns out that the land that was given Makere University has, was previously given to the Baruli, and so Makere University must find some other place to, you know, to do the things it wants to do. So the questions about the birth, the constituent parts of Uganda are alive questions. And we are privileged to have with us Nicolas Opio, who is, who has, I think, unlike myself, I'm in that weird space where I have friends who have been to, who are in exile. And I, and I find it very strange because there used to be a time when exile for us were things that our parents spoke about. When we were in exile, uh, when in those bad days, now my friend Kakwenza is not with us, not in Uganda, for fear of his life. And in refugee law, they talk about a well-founded fear of persecution. You cannot have any better founded fear than one whose evidence is on your back. We also. We all saw the scars. My friend 
Stella Nyanzi, who has actually who did a lot of work with the Human Rights and Peace Center way back in 2001. I remember we were part of the project on, uh, on uh, resilience and vulnerability. 2001, 2002, there's an actual one of the working papers of Hurepec is by Stella Nyanzi. Today, she's in exile. A couple of years ago, one of my other friends was in exile, Nicolas Opio. So, Bizemu. The things we heard about are back with us. The Uganda that we thought about, we are told about, that is cracking at its seams and in its, at its core and everywhere else. That Uganda that is under contestation everywhere um, is, is really what we have to be thinking about. We must find a way of living together as brothers or perishing together as fools. I invite Nicholas to speak to us and speak with us about Huripex's journey. I, I doubt very much that Malema Rizzi can accuse him of not doing. He has done a lot and he has done a lot of thoughtful work. Yeah, his work has been informed by thinking. And I think uh, when we could have no better person to, to guide us in this journey of reflection than and Nicolas Opio, and, and without further ado, I'd like to invite you, sir, to speak with us on our journey. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kabumba Abusinje, for those, I don't know if they were inspiring, they're a bit depressing introductions. The Deputy Vice Chancellor in charge of Finance and Administration, Professor Henry Adunaitwe, Dr. Zahara Nampero, the Acting Deputy Principal of the School of Law, Dr. Kabumba Businje, the Acting Director of the Human Rights and Peace Center, the heads of departments here present, members of the teaching and non teaching staff of the School of Law members of the civil society, the diplomatic corps, invited guests, students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen and others, and like Professor Joe Locker used to say, relatives, friends and in-laws. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak this morning. When Kawumba sent me the email, asking me to come and speak. I was hesitant to come. First, because as he said, I've been away for two years out of the country. I only came back about three and a half months ago. I'm still trying to learn the things I missed in the two years I've been away. And so I thought, what would I say this morning really if I came? But I also feared something else. I thought that in many universities now, there's a council culture that if I came here, many of you would be protesting that that vile man should not take the podium and speak here today. If you see the conversations on Twitter or X space now, many of you perhaps don't share the views that I hold. So I feared you would protest. And that fear became even more eminent when I saw a big banner at the, at the entrance of the university. I thought that the police would come and stop this meeting, that they would raid it and say, I shouldn't speak here today. But I'm glad that I'm able to do so in a very civil and what I see as a very accommodating environment, despite our differences of opinion. I hope you don't heckle me along the way. I really pray you don't. But if you may permit me, let me first express my deep gratitude to the directors present and past of Uripec for the honor of inviting me to speak in no less occasion than the 30th anniversary of Uripec. The many directors that have come before Dr. Kabumba were indeed, in my view, very inspiring and visionary leaders who led Uripec in difficult times. 
But I'm also honored because I speak before you today addressing some of the people that I look up to. If you are a lawyer in this town and you didn't look up to Joe Loka Onyango, I can guarantee you, you are a very bad lawyer. We looked up to him. As he said, he was here in 1979, just a year before I was born. So I grew up hearing and reading about him. But I also want to thank my boss and friend, Dr. Zahra Nampeo, who chairs the board of Chapter 4 Uganda where I work. Many of you know about Chapter 4. It's a civil rights organization based here in Kampala that just recently marked 10 years of its existence. Of course, unlike Uripec, Chapter 4 is very young. Uripec is quite old, 30 years. But in reflecting upon the journey of Uripec, we must ask ourselves, what were the circumstances in the country at the time Uripec was formed on December 2nd, 1993. Many of you who are students of history will know that in 1993, it was a very difficult time for this country. The country was about to go into a process to make a constitution. We were also just about coming to the end of the Justice Oda Commission report, the investigations into violations of human rights from 1962 to 1986. We had a government in power that was still in its honeymoon, that had come into power a few years before signing many human rights instruments. Between 1986 and 1990, Uganda acceded to several international human rights instruments. So people were hopeful, but at the same time, very skeptical. Skeptical because the process of enacting the constitution was a process that many people have called very uh, pivotal in the history of our country. But many who have studied it very closely know that it was a process riddled with manipulation of the process. I don't know if many of you read about the three wonderful ladies in parliament or at the CA who were giving out money to CA delegates at the time. I think the founders of Uripec saw ahead of their times that this honeymoon goodwill time also portends danger for this country. And that if we didn't have people working tirelessly to hold them to account, many things would go bad. And so the formation of Uripec was in so many ways visionary. But I also think it was revolutionary. Professor Joe said there were the mosquitoes making noise, causing inconvenience and disrupting processes. That disruption at the time was necessary. And I think many of us would wonder where we would be without those disruptions. In that respect, therefore, Uripec has played a pivotal role in the history of our country uh, since its formation. We should mark 30 years with pride. And I'll tell you my own personal story. Just before I came here, I was telling Dr. Kabumba when he took me to the boardroom, he asked me a question. Have you ever been to this boardroom? And I told him, yes, I've been here many times. And I reminded him that I'm a two-time school dropout of Makere University. Because in 1999, when I was joining law school, I was admitted to Makere for the evening class. As a poor boy from Gulu at the time, the tuition fee alone for an evening class was 900,000 shillings. I couldn't afford it. So I lingered on here for a few weeks until my professors then, uh, Professor Dr. Henry Honoria and his good friend, uh, the late Becca Wairama, told me, we have a law school where we are also teaching. Why don't you come to the law school? And so that was my first dropout from Makere. 
Um, I failed, I was poor, I couldn't afford it. And so I went to UCU and got my law degree from UCU. But there was a reason why I wanted to come to Makere and not go to UCU. Because growing up, Makere was synonymous to the word university. You, <laughs> you never went to a university until you came to Makere. Precisely because it was the birthplace of many great people in this country. It was also a place of ideas. It was a place where you had hope that even if the views you hold were wrong, you could say them. Even if the views you hold were unpopular, you'd still say them. And so I wanted to be at Makerere. When I failed, I spent most of my four years in this auditorium, sometimes sitting in lectures where I wasn't supposed to sit in, but many times really coming to listen to great speakers who stood on this platform speaking in the South in days such as the Saudi Odoma Day, I wanted to be a part of a vibrant community, a society where ideas flourished. We had controversial Marxist speakers like the former uh, lecturer here, Professor Juko. We had people who were very controversial, who I think at some point even formed a political party like Dr. Barrier. We wanted to be a part of this community. When I finished law school, I tried for a second time. I enrolled here for my master's program. Back then, I was a little small program officer at the Foundation for Human Rights Initiative as a researcher. My boss then was my sister, Kara Dutch. She was the director of the, of the research unit, and I was her junior. I spent one year studying, and I finished all my classworks. But I dropped out a second time because I couldn't afford the cost of doing my thesis. So my career has always been dear to me. As a failure, two-time dropout, I admired the university greatly. So in many ways, coming back here is really fulfilling. I went on much later, of course, to study in other places, but I didn't hold those places as dear as I did Makere, because Makere was a place for robust debates. My primary school mate became a guild president here, Mr. Dennis Okema. We would come here for his campaign, come here for his speeches. But is it still the same university that I come back to many years after? I think that Looking from the outside inward, it's a far different place. Makere we see today is now a world community. The place is fenced. To get in, you must get through a gate. You have to get checked. To get out, you must show that you paid your parking fee. If you don't pay, you can have a lot of inconvenience. The university is not the same, not the one that I grew up admiring. The culture of debate, of robust disagreement, seems to be on retreat. The walling of the university has gone beyond the creation of the walls you see outside, but also the walling of ideas, where a university professor can get punished for holding a contrary view especially about the governance issues of our country. The launch of the five-year project, therefore, is a welcome initiative that I think in many ways should bring Makere to the place where it started, as a place for robust debate. But that these debates would not only end in the four walls of this university, but provide an important point for developing and shaping the policies of this country. Looking back at the projects that Uripec has done in the past, this contribution has been enormous in terms of the papers they have written, publications that they have made. I hope that this five-year project will translate into a process 
that perhaps very forcefully inserts itself in the governance of our country. Because as Dr. Kabomba has said, there is a deep crisis that threatens not just the governance of our country, but the peace and human rights of all Ugandans. Dr. Kabumba said in a joking way that I was in exile. Perhaps you laughed, but it wasn't funny. It really wasn't funny. When I was asked to speak at, the, at a faculty meeting of the, of the car center at the Harvard Kennedy School, I told the professors that I was at Harvard against my will. Many people would go to Harvard willingly and be happy and proud to go there. But I didn't want to go to Harvard. I was forced to leave this country to go and take up a two-year sabbatical teaching uh, at the Carr Center for Human Rights. The reason why I left the country is really the crisis that Kabumba has, has said. And I'm speaking for the first time since then. This is the first public appearance since I came back in the country. But let me transport you into the reasons why I left the country. We were at the, were in the middle of an election and we were involved in investigating and documenting extrajudicial killings on the streets of Kampala by the Ugandan state during the elections, especially the events following the arrest of the opposition leader, Robert Chagulanyi Bobby Wine, in Luka district. We had done extensive documentation of human rights abuse by the state that included torture, disappearances, extrajudicial killings. At the time of our arrest, myself and four other researchers had documented 158 killings by the state in two days in the districts of Luka, Iganga, Wakiso, Kampala, Masaka, and Entebbe. Now, you can imagine in the middle of an election, the state killing its own citizen. And we thought we were doing a noble duty of documenting these violations and trying to seek justice. But on the 22nd of December, while I was having lunch at a cheap restaurant in, uh, in Kamocha, three drones pull up in the parking lot of the restaurant and about 18 masked men, they are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are always men, they are no women, with bulletproof vests, helmets and long guns, make a dash to my table and arrest me and my four researchers. We were handcuffed and taken into a drone and a sack that to this day the smell is in my mind, that smelled rotten human blood was put on my head. And we were driven away to CMI headquarters and eventually dumped uh, hours later in Chireka. The rest, as they say, is history. I found myself in a maximum security prison in Chitalia. And thereafter, when I came out begging to be tried after nine months, charges were then withdrawn. Now, when these charges were withdrawn, there were plans to rearrest uh, rearrest me in the in the court premises and these plans were leaked to us by people who worked for the security agencies who told me you must leave if you don't leave they're going to rearrest you and take you to a military court of course I fled I fled the country as my lawyers turned up in court uh, to process the withdrawal of the charges I was airborne I was airborne, I was on a plane to, to Cairo and subsequently to Harvard. And being away gave me time to reflect. And I think that the process I went through was really a demonstration of the crisis of governance that Dr. Kabumba talked about. My father died when I was away, I couldn't come to bury him. It was a sad moment. I'm sure Kakwenza, he may not admit that on Twitter, but he would love to be here himself uh, and stay in this country. That is the crisis we are facing. And coming back, I still don't feel safe. And that's why I said if, 
you know, when I was invited, I thought that the police would come here and close this meeting. They may not come, but the sense of fear that, that, has, that, that has been instilled in me really reflects the fear that many Ugandans are going through. When you hear perhaps the very casual nature in which the response of the state is couched about disappearances in this country, the discussions in parliament, you'd want to cry. You'd want to cry. Cry because it's painful for our country, but cry because many of the individuals who have disappeared, I have sat with their wives, I've spoken to their children, I've spoken to their loved ones. They want closure. But you hear the Speaker of Parliament treat this really as a joke, and the Minister for Internal Affairs report to Parliament a joke. Now, I share this not to depress you, but to paint for you a real life example of the human cost of the crisis that we all face in this country. You may think that you're safe because you're a son of a general, because your father is a minister, or because you have a good job at the university or elsewhere. But unless all of us are safe, I think that this crisis will be at your door. The building of large walls and high fences in this country is a typical exemplification of the fear under which all of us live. Our homes have become prisons, really prisons. If you go back to your home, look at your home. There's a burglar proof, there's a door. Those of you who have means, there might be security lights, a fierce dog. That is not a sign of safety, it's a sign of fear. And that fear is the crisis that we as a country find ourselves in. I think that centers like Uripec should be a place to provide at least ideas and solutions for this crisis. It would be a tragedy, in my view, if the scholars in this country heed the calls of politicians to go and rear goats and pigs and leave politics to them. As you have seen from the crop of leaders we have in parliament, they need help. They need help. And there's no better place for them to find that help in the academia. Huripec in the past has taken bold, sometimes controversial steps and taken part in national politics. I think the time now is to increase the pressure, run faster, get engaged in every democratic discourse out there and guide this country. The tragedy is if you leave it to politicians to decide the future of this country, we are going to be in a deep, deep, to use a bad word, deep shit. Because the very worst of us are now making policies that determine our lives. And so, Huripec's role in the fight for social justice, the defense of human rights, is a clarion call. I think it is a duty for everybody in this country, and in particular, for people here at Huripec. Those of us in civil society pledge our continued support to Huripec and its community in the fight for a better country, a more peaceful country, a more democratic country. Let me sound a warning. There are going to be many people who will throw dirt on you, who will condemn you, criticize you for the things you do. Because criticism is the easiest thing to do. Any fool can criticize. And there are many fools around. But you should not waver from your commitment to defending fundamental rights and freedoms for every single Ugandan, whether it is a sexual minority or an ethnic minority, or indeed women who are facing structural repression from a system of patriarchy. You should always stand out to defend fundamental rights and freedoms. As I conclude, let us remember that the pursuit of knowledge is not detached academic exercise, but a journey that intertwines with the broader issues facing our society. Makere University, and Uripec in particular, with its rich history, has a potential to be a catalyst, 
a catalyst for positive change as we reclaim the space for Uganda's body politics as, activi as, as activists, let us do it with a sense of responsibility, a commitment to justice, an unwavering belief in the transformative power of education. Congratulations, Yuri Peck, on 30 years. We wish you 30 more years, and we will join you in your next project to reshape, to rethink the future of this country. In rethinking the future of this country, let's define what the crisis is and be bold in doing so. Because sometimes if you don't prescribe the ailment, you might get a wrong prescription. Let's dis discuss what the crisis is and discuss it openly and candidly. Secondly, let's offer bold, innovative ideas for the reform of this country because this country is bleeding and needs all of us to come together to defend fundamental rights and freedoms. Good luck in your exams and good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for that, Mr. Nicholas Opio. The very first time that I had the name Mr. Nicholas Opio, I am a debater. I was making research about a human rights debate and when he narrates his stories today, I feel like I have lived them before because I have repeated those examples over and over again. Chapter four, Nicholas Opio, bundled up, taken, arrested. So I can say that that experience is not fruitless. That experience has started conversations and you are an example in conversations that can spark off change. Uh, it has been a pretty gloomy conversation, though there is hope. Uh, next on our agenda is going to be a poem by Alice Namale to show you that, yes, even in the midst of these gruesome conversations, there is hope. You're most welcome, Alice. A round of applause. For the YouTube people, unfortunately, I'm going to have to use a microphone. <laughs> My name is Namale Aliskes, and I'm going to be presenting a poem. I like using poetry for, edut for edutainment, which is education while entertaining people. The Constitution is broken, fundamentally broken in more ways than one, in more places than I can count. I could be living below the poverty line, but still even then, the Constitution would be more broke, and it's long overdue for amend. We, the people of Uganda, recalling our history, Recognizing our struggles, committed to building a better future, we wrote a very admirable preamble, then went ahead to fumble with the text underneath it. We swore to be better, but I swear every time the Constitution remembers that oath, it gets bitter. If laws if laws could resign, the 1995 Constitution would be on vacation in the Bahamas. It's long overdue for amend. I could be living below the poverty line, but even then, the Constitution would be more broke. And in more places than I can count, in more ways than one, the Constitution is broken, fundamentally broken. That's the first stanza, but upside down, just like the state of Uganda right now. You see, 
Article 2 says the Constitution shall have binding force on all persons and authorities in Uganda, but there are persons and authorities in Uganda that have binding force over the Constitution. Don't you agree? Anyone who violates the Constitution unlawfully should be punished. But you see, demonstrators protesting breaches of the Constitution are being punished heavily. A clear mockery of Article 3, don't you see? The system is broken, fundamentally broken, in more ways than one, in more places than I can count. I could be living below the poverty line, but even then the system could be more broke and it's long overdue for amend for example chapter four is on the law students chapter four of the constitution is on human rights but there is nothing right about the way humans are left begging for freedoms that are supposed to be inherent chapter five is on Chapter 5 on the Constitution is on representation of the people. But the people's representatives are beat up and imprisoned for speaking for the people. And yes, we have elections, but are they free and fair is another question. With the ballot rigging, agent imprisoning, military presence, and internet shutting, the answer to that question is very clear. Chapter 6 is on the legislature, chapter 7 is on the executive, chapter 8 is on the judiciary, and these are supposed to all be autonomous, but that's not what we see in reality. The MPs that were singing Toji Kwatako, Tuala Bengeri Police, Jiaba Kwatako, not to forget the Black Mamba incident, a clear tragedy to the autonomy of the judiciary. That is why we are very grateful that Harry Peck fell in love with the Constitution despite all her bruises and flaws. So today we ask Harry Peck, do you, Harry Peck, take the Constitution to be your lawfully wedded project <laughs> to love and to hold to mend and to fend for, to fix and to treat, to revive to the state it should have been. I do. We do. <laughs> because the constitution is broken, fundamentally broken, in more ways than one, in more places, than I can count. I could be living below the poverty line, but even then the constitution could be more broke and it's long overdue for amend. Thank you. Wow, that is so beautiful. That was so beautiful. Alice Namale was our former minister for justice in the university. For those that don't know, that is a beautiful poem she has coined there. So much has been said. I'm sure at this point, we also have poems of our own. They may not be as good as, but yes, we want to voice them out. This is the opportunity. We are going to have reactions from our audience. It could be in form of a question. It could be in form of something you want to say that also proves that maybe the constitution is more broke than you are. But yes, this is the moment. You can raise up your hand and a microphone will be passed around. And for purposes of record, we want to make you famous. You give us your name and what you do in the university. Jeffrey. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to finally listen to uh, Council Nicolas Opio. Uh, as the presenter has mentioned, I've also been a debater and we have shared uh, the work you've done in our debate spaces. So it is an honor to finally interface with you. So my question is on the challenge for Huripik. I've been uh, fortunate to benefit from the PILAC pro programs, which is in line with uh, Huripik. But as a student leader, and I'm speaking uh, from my experiences that uh, I've had as a student leader on Guild, serving as the chairperson of the Guild Tribunal, and you know we are faced with matters of dispensing justice. But we face a challenge with, and, and Council Nicholas Opio talked about it, how the university has changed. So my question is on challenging Curipec on the kind of students we are nurturing. Has Curipec endeavored to make sure that the, 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 the challenges they are advocating for at the national level uh, can be advocated for at this level. For instance, uh, we have student representatives and student leaders who try to voice students' concerns. And these students' concerns are human rights based, at least from the human rights law I've studied. They are fundamentally human rights based issues of student welfare, issues of um, student rights, education and ETC. But it is surprising that a student leader or a prospective student leader can organize a Twitter space and the next day there is a letter suspending that student. That is a very problematic environment. And when that student is suspended, and I've interacted with a few of them, I won't mention their names. When that student is taken through that process, we have very bad laws at Macquarie University which allow administrators to suspend students without giving them a hearing. Then they wait for the next time the Senate sits. A student has already lost one or two years. And by the time they go through that rigorous mental torture, any student you will talk to who has gone through that process will tell you, ah, nowadays I don't want to talk about student issues. Let me read my books and I leave this place. And the challenge is that these students, when they graduate, you know, we have this concept when some of us who have gone into leadership, they accuse us yearly day. You get. So when a student goes through that, that process, he is forced to eat. You get. Because they say if you cannot challenge them, you join them. When these students leave university, they join the, the government in perpetrating these injustices. And I won't mention some of the national leaders we have, but we have them. They were former student leaders at the university, but they have changed. And before we blame them for why they have changed, we need to look at what they underwent through at the university. So my challenge to Ripek is that can it focus its attention on the current students' concerns such that we, are, we do not have student leaders being forced into eating such that when they go into the, the, the uh, national leadership positions, they do not become the agents of the human rights violations that we keep talking about and complaining about. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bill, for that. Uh, we shall get a response later from the doctor. Uh, there is a hand up there. We shall get a few more responses. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hilary. I'm a student of economics. Um, you see, a policy, we say a policy is a deliberate measure taken. So I'm trying to see the policies in this university. Are they trying to nurture students deliberately in that manner? Of fearing fear, they are inserting fear in the students. Me personally, I've been arrested in these issues of demonstrating, and now you can't put an, an uprising and you say, You come, you are fighting for this, and I come. Because I already have already read the laws of the university, I know the Students Guild of uh, Statute of 2022 is inconsistent to the Constitution, and I wonder the students of laws here. 
For us, we are at Cobham's. I am reading the laws. I know they are inconsistent. There is students here who are, re who are studying the law. Uh, are you aware that the Guild Statute of 2022 is inconsistent to the Uganda Constitution? What have you done on it? Me, I've written to the clerk of parliament under FDC. I'm a member of FDC. I've written to the lead of opposition about that issue. But nothing is happening. You demonstrate, of, by the, you demonstrate the next day your suspension letter will be out. Right now I'm speaking, but I might find it. <laughs> <laughs> This might, it might sound funny, but we have, we have a vice chancellor who suspends on WhatsApp. <laughs> In my circle, have a lot of people who have been suspended. You turn into an activist into, in this generation. I don't know that if the principals of colleges and dean of, deans of schools are also in that fear that they are deliberately inserting into our generation, such that we live into a, a scary manner. I don't know. Uh, I wrote an article trying to, trying to see what, what role Makere University can do in the country's economy. Then I, I reached into an office of a lecturer at my school. The guy was like, you man, do you want to graduate? Because the article was headed, blame Makere University. Then he read like two letters, like one paragraph was like, you man, do you want to graduate? I kept it. You can't find a publication of a Makere University student anywhere in this country right now. So I don't know if it is deliberately done such that our generation is, such that over the country falls down to the ground. I don't know. The law students themselves, they can't stand up to defend the fake laws. You see, whatever they do, the way they passed this guild statute, uh, some people, they said, students are the ones to, to do that thing. So, Ori, <laughs> the student leader talked about it, Varia, Bona, everyone who was there, the list of names can be can be tabled because there is no student who can agree to those laws. If I may ask, why, why are we going to have an online election next semester? 30 seconds. So, why are we going to have online elections next semester? It was brought due to COVID. So what are the reasons that you can table to us that are sensible to us? And you tell us, these are the reasons you can't be allowed to campaign in a free in a free country where you say everyone can speak what they want. So, Pyrak, I was trying to also get some data on you in my article, but... Uh, <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> it's quite clear that everyone is living in fear. Uh, before we come to you, we have a remark from someone that's online, Awa Nelson. He can say something before we move to the people in here. Um, thank you so much, uh, Huri Peck, uh, and uh, the rest of the people attending physically. Thank you so much, Council Nicholas Opio, and uh, the rest. I really wanted to come and attend, but uh, I, I got to know very late. So my concern goes to, I have seen the Deputy Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Ainaitwe around. And so my concern so much to him, you can hear the sound of the voices from the students crying. You and I know that whoever is strong and vibrant out there has been so because of the Makere they went to. We wonder then, those of us who have gone through the Makere of this time, What's the fate for us? I have seen all the notables that are, in, are out there having strong positions of power and whatever they did at the university is what we have been stopped from doing. We get out, 
when we are as dull as nothing, we have not done advocacy, we have done nothing to put us out there. For the record, when I was coming to the university, my mom told me, my son, if there is a cause for students, be in with the students, join them. So that by the time you leave the university, you're somewhere. Then at some point she called and she said, my son, your university is tough. Your university has changed. My, my, I, I keep wondering every day, um, recalling my, my successor's message being, today when they suspend a, uni, a student, all they call you to do, there is that person in the university. He calls the students in the night. Just come and apologize, come and apologize. I apologize for what? And when they enter, when they go for the committee, all they have to do, I am very sorry. Now, you wonder what happens, the right to fair hearing and whatsoever. And that's only what can make you be reinstated in the university, even in circumstances where the university was wrong. So my question is, if you ever talk to this uh, congregation, what's the plight of these students that are going through this current university? The people that are holding positions in the university are doing so because they understood the university, they did advocacy, and they understood the students' cause, be it for the vice chancellor, be it for the university secretary who was a good president, and all other people, be it Nobat Mao, who is the minister of justice, and all other ministers. They did advocacy, the government knew them, and for us, you want us to graduate when no one knows us. Takumba Nelson, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nelson. Uh, before we move to his insight, I would ask us to ask questions even beyond the university, to share our insights even beyond the university framework. Thank you. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, I want to begin with apologizing to Mr. Nicholas Opio. I personally misjudged him, though I do not believe in whatever he says, but some, um, especially justice, really is firm founded. Uh, Edmund Buck once said, I'm going to paraphrase that evil persists not because there are so many bad people, but because the good people do nothing. And I'm again, I know Mr. Kawumba likes us quoting, giving authorities not what we think, and I'm again going to quote from what I got from a documentary about Mr. Robert Mongariso Sobuke. What I got was every leader, every person who agitates for a better tomorrow should be able and willing to take his people through a hell of suffering. The fact is, you see, very good people like Mr. Kawumba, the likes of Professor Oloka, the likes of us who are called the learning friends, we come here and we have invested all our energy in reading books. Yes, the papers are very important, but we as young people always have that green card, that upper hand, in that the evils that are there today, we always have that ability to change them. Trust me, the regime that came by gun, honestly, I find it quite impossible for them to kneel before something written. So as a country who do not have those leaders, have the discipline to follow that. So I don't know whether I'll be arrested or anything, but I'm not scared. I'm not scared. I re-echo this, and I'm going to say it. Yesterday, I had put it on my status. The, future, the present and the past persists as long as there is suffering, and the future does not come unless the shackles and chains of suffering are not broken. This injustice, as long as we sit comfortable, and all of us to Agara Kuria, the system is going to continue. I like what that man has said. We, some of us who study the law, personally have been a very big supporter of the government in power. But I'm utterly dismayed by 
such a revelation. 152 people killed in two days. So I did try every two hours, a life of a person was coming to an end. Ladies and gentlemen, it's up to us to think, will this country keep taking that trajectory or we can determine where it goes next? Thank you, I beg to submit. Thank you so much. Finally, we have someone who is not living in fear. So we shall take her and then him. There is a lady there, yes? Yes, uh, good. good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Atai Isabel Nicole, the General Secretary of the Makere Law Society. And the person that is very passionate about human rights, uh, I feel it is a responsibility that we have to take on as individuals, not only because we are human, but because for any country to thrive, there must be respect for human rights. So my question to you, Ripek, is you see, the, the question of human rights, when you try to make an investigation, it is a conversation that usually happens between mostly elites, people that are learned and people that um, have, had the, have had the privilege of probably coming to law school, probably coming to the university. And even if you are to look beyond um, law school, there are some people in different colleges that do not know anything about human rights. Today morning as I left my room, I told my roommate that I am going for a symposium that is being held by Uripec. And the person was like, what is Uripec? So my question to um, Dr. Businja Kabumba is that what is Uripec doing to ensure that it goes beyond law school? Because truthfully, the majority of people that know about Uripec are people that are learned, people that are in law school, they are lawyers among others. So what is Uripec doing to ensure that they broaden their scope beyond law school, beyond the university, and try to reach the people that may not have had the privilege of coming to school and learning about human rights? That is my question. Thank you so much. Atai? The gentleman with specs, and lastly, okay, we could start with him. Uh, good, good afternoon. I'm called Isavle Michael. Yeah, now, the question of human rights, I, I think we are all pretenders. That's something I want to talk about. Uh, when you look at our political parties, when you look at civil society, when you look at the state itself, I think we are all pretenders. The, the thing is, we are a law lawless country. That's where we are supposed to start from. There is no respect for the judiciary. J just of recent, the justice, like Kisachi, asked for a resignation. The president refused to give him his retirement one. That was one. The other thing is the military court. Most of the times, we have told the military court not to enter into civilian cases. It has persisted. Like, you, you look at the legislature. We ask for a report about the missing people, of you, the missing Ugandans. People take about 40, 40 days to reply to the opposition. I, I think we are all pretending about human rights. We are, it's a crisis that we have found ourselves in. And I think we need to pull out the, the, the article that tells us to overthrow the Constitution. That's where we are supposed to be. I, I'm, 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 not, I, I'm not timid about it, but I think, because when you look, when, when you look, at, look, look at Uganda, look at Uganda, we are all talking about human rights, we are talking about elections almost each and every other time. So I, I want to ask Council Nicolas Sopio, if the state is unwilling, what do we citizens do? That's what I want to ask. If the state is unwilling, what should we do? That, that's the only thing I want to ask. Thank you so much. What do we do? Thank you very much. My name is John Vianney Ayoware. 
and I'm a student of law here. Uh, where I come from, we used to have a member of parliament. Every time it was campaign times, he would come and when he faced a serious challenger, he would ask the voters. Uh, I come from Chinchizu West, that's Nikanungu. And that was John Patrick Amama Mbabas. So he would ask the voters, do you want to be like Congo? If you vote me out, or if you vote NRM out, then we are likely to have the same situation that we have in Congo here. Of course, he had a serious challenge one time, James Musingu Garuga, and at one time he lost the election. He declared himself. The case came to the High Court, and um, the High Court ordered the re election. But because of the violence that had happened, uh, James Musingu Garuga opted not to go for uh, uh, another election. So, the word fear, I think, has made, has made it today. It is the most used word here. It is a deliberate policy that right from how we choose leaders up to how they make policies, we are supposed to keep quiet and only comply with what they intend us to, 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 to comply with. My challenge to Hulipek is one, that in this era where we have a budget controlled by a single family, and we are in an era where we have words like command center medias, influencers, you know? In one day, they can picture one of us to be a rebel, an ADF rebel, and it becomes true. Just in a single one day like this, it is a matter of discharging their machine, their propaganda machine. So how are you going to cope? How are you going to cope with this challenge in this era where we have influencers, command center medias, who can ideally influence the thinking of Ugandans? I'll give you an example how the thinking of Ugandans has been uh, challenged. If you discuss with a normal Ugandan, like why has Nicholas Opio suffered the way he has suffered? One may tell you that he invited that misfortune upon himself. Why would he bother to document what he has not been told to document? <laughs> and you see someone who can frame a good argument in that line, and you also find that holds some water if you are an average thinker. So how are we going to cope with this challenge? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Before we come back to more of the insights, we shall get some replies. Can I be the last? Yes. We shall get a few replies or comments Can I be the last? from Hiri Peck and whoever has been asked some of those tough questions of the day. However, before we get there, Allow me to invite our very own, our president of the Makere Law Society, John Mary Kaira, to say something small. They are the hosts of today's event. They gave us a space. So let him say something in a few before we get replies to the insights. A round of applause. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Praise. At the moment, when I be in class, I be like, ah, is praise really my classmate? But when you go back and praise is asking some cases, I be like, yeah, praise is my classmate. Today, Hiri Peck is at 30. That was 1993. After 10 years, my mother thought I would be brought into this world. After 20 years, I'm the president of Makelo Society. And Hiri Peck is here at the premises of Makelo Society. Uh, I don't call it luck, I'll term it as destiny. Because who knew that after 30 years, a gentleman like me will be here 
sharing some of the prospects with Hiripek. To begin with, I hold many posts at the university. I've been trying to meet the DVC, that DVC is not there, come back next time, come back next time, it's not there, but today, Professor Henry, you are here in the building. <laughs> and I will utilize my chance. Uh, when I came into power, they told me, John Mary, you are the chairperson, Council of College Chairpersons. We want progenates back. I wrote letters to the dean. The dean of students told me, gentlemen, you are the one who wants to club at night. You want part at, at night. I'm like, no, dean, I'm, 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 I'm fighting for the rights of students. Which rights do you have at night? Well, I made a proposal. I even changed it from porridge nights to orientation nights. I really don't know where the letter stopped, but well, Prof. Hen, Professor Henry, I feel like you can follow up on that. Then the next thing, when people write, they're arrested. They run to Makelo Society. They are like, Makelo Society, Mukolachi, come procure bonds. I usually work with Honorable Guinera. So Honorable Guinera and I put our, put our, put our, put our neckties on and we got the police advocates. They were like, want, the, want to procure a bond, what, what, something like that. Well, leadership has not been easy because I've tried to get students from prison. You go there as a student leader. A student is arrested at maybe eight. Um, you got the police, the OC is like, you guys from Makere, you leaders, they are like, they warn you, we saw you in a riot, but we never, saw, we, 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 we never cuffed you. Next time, we shall come for you. Right now at Makere, eviction is going on. Uh, we are going to enter your exams soon, next week. We have been having printer guys there. Dr. BK, actually, like, um, when I was joining Gethry, I was like, I'm going to do only open books and partial open books. And I usually buy my statutes at the last minute. But this time round, I think I bought my statutes before because the ladies there, they're no longer there. We are quiet because as the president of Makelo Society, they're going to be like, you don't have locusts in these things. You came to study, read, leave power, leave it for another one. You continue. Is the right to fair hearing a myth in Macquarie University? Yes, it's a myth. We no longer know that there is fair hearing. This fair, the rights fair hearing, where, which I learned in tier two in administrative law, where by natural justice you are brought, you have an advocate, that doesn't work at Macquarie. You sleep, wake up, you were student leader, but also you. You don't have immunity on suspensions. So there is nothing like immunity to maybe leaders. You're going to be treated as a commoner, as a layperson. So if a student is treated like that, if a student leader is treated like that, then what about a lay student? I go back to the panel. Um, I've worked under the different dignitaries here. Prof. Henry, I've worked under them. Uh, Dr. Zahara, she has been delegating duties, and once I finish, I'll be like, Dr. Zahara, I'm done. Like, good. Uh, Dr. Bike, we have had some good connections there and there. Uh, one person I missed working with is uh, Mr. Nicholas, and I'll look for you and we work together. <clears throat> At 30 years, we are with Huri Peck here. Ripek is nurturing prominent people. It's nurturing leaders. Professor Olokaways. I've seen Professor Olok around. Um, Dr. BK, Dr. Zahara has been there at Ripek. Um, Ripek also is um, a recognized center for research. A month back, I was having a, a discussion with, um, with, the students from, with the students from Ethiopia, masters. I'm like, hey, how are you doing? What, what, something like that. I was like, what are you doing in Uganda? He was like, actually, I'm here to do research on what 
on um uh like <clears throat> was telling me like is he had to do research i'm like why do you choose uganda is it because we have a lot of problems that it's going to become easier for you to like uh disseminate this and go on and like it's going to be easier for you it's like um Huri Peck is a good one like uh the the guy whom i was interacting with was he never brought me i asked him uganda but he brought me back to Huri Peck. so that means that Huri Peck in the 30 years it hasn't rested like other organization which come up and then they fed other organizations which come up and then they fail to stand on their missions and maybe their visions um while well, hupik is celebrating for 30 years uh, i'm privileged to tell you that mls makelo society is older than hupik <laughs> so makelo society is not a joke it's rounding up it's going to have maybe 55 years so as we pick is celebrating 30 years, we are going to work hand in hand with Hillary Pick to see to it that, whereas Mr. Hillary has noted that you suspend students, what and that, and so forth and so on, we are going to work hand in hand with Hillary Pick such that at least the rights to the students of Macquarie can be brought out. I can promise you that as long as I'm in, as long as I'm in power, but if I, if at all like I leave power, my friend like I also will have no immunity. So my immunity lies somewhere. But what I can tell you that Tripe has organized here talks, whatever in this auditorium. I for one think that in this auditorium there's something like absolute immunity, whereby that if you speak something in this auditorium, they're not going, they're not going to arrest you. That oh you have done this, you have done this and this and this. Uh, recently we are having the anti anti homosexuality debate here and also the right to abortion i really love that but if you go outside you'll be castigated for uh your your, your ideologies but whereas i treasure this auditorium and i thank dr zahara for trying to renovate it whenever it's getting old at least there is some renovation it's done so the thing with you pick it helps us to enlighten our visions when we come in year one, we come with lawyers have to go to court. You find Dr. BK in the class, poses some questions, you'll be like, eh, will I manage? Whereas like, as he's posing some questions, he's learning that, oh, John Mary is good. At least I can employ John Mary to be, to be a research assistant. So in that confusion there, as we're trying to figure out what's the next, how are we going to survive? Peripik is there for us. It has tried to work with Pilak. We thank um, the, I've seen the CLE class and also like there's a BLC class which is going on for third years. I feel like I have to congratulate and appreciate Peripik. We have tried to partner up with the refugee law project. Um, hopefully next semester we shall be launching the refugee law club here. And uh, we have seen we are trying to enrich in the environmental law. Um, something like next week, there will be there, there was a communication which was put out for students who want to attend something like environmental law clinic somewhere. So, as I conclude, being a president of Makelo Society has been such a honor. And uh, being part of law school and being part at least to try to tap in the resources of Europe, it hasn't left me the same. I really think after here, in the five year agenda for Europe, we're going to be working hand in hand with the coming leaders, with the leaders that are there, just to eat that in the five years as Europe is coming up and maybe growing stronger. We are trying to restructure and redefine Makelo Society. May God bless the Makelo Society. I'm Engine May Kaira, the president of Makelo Society. Thank you so much, John Mary. John Mary is a young, ambitious man. I got to meet John Mary in our year one, 
when we're joining, but by the end of the first week, everyone knew who John Mary was. You are an inspiration to me too. Uh, we have had a lot of bitter things said here today. Uh, one word that has stood out is fear. Growing up, I had a very big fear for medicine, tablets. And to swallow tablets, my mom usually got the tiny bananas and put the medicine in the middle. Uh, my mom would always get the medicine and put it in, in between the banana, then I would swallow the banana and not the tablet directly. It usually made it so easy. I think to also, you know, wash down a little bit of this conversation, in a few, we shall have our very own Prima present something to us. But before that, we feel that, we feel that it would be very important to listen from our very own Professor Ben on what has been said. So a round of applause as we welcome the professor to say something. Uh, thank you very much. You'll excuse me with my, my, my heart, but that's part of human rights. <laughs> Freedom of expression in terms of dress. Thank you, Dr. Businja Kabumba, for uh, this assembly about the 30 years. Uh, Nicholas, thank you very much. I passed by Nicholas when he was trying to find parking, he lowered his, uh, he lowered his uh, glass window, the, the, the window, window glass. When I peeped there, he looked the other side and ah, I said, this must be a strong state of fear. <laughs> I have listened to the discussion here and I'm excited about it. But let's not lose sight of a very important aspect of the struggle for human rights that Philippec has been engaged in. And in this, I would like us to reinvigorate the discussion on social economic rights. I think this is very critical. It's very important to talk about civil and political rights, how they are being violated, how we are being killed, wounded, etc. But I'm telling you, if you talk about torture, there's what I call social torture. 16 women die per day due to maternal, avoid maternal death. About 26% of those are girls and women who died due to unsafe abortion. These are issues that are really talked about. We are talking about land grabbing, environmental rights. For the young people here, you are lucky to be here, but do you know the levels of inequality in education, access to education. How many of the girls and boys access university education? These are serious human rights violations, in spite of guarantees under Article 30 of our constitution. Issues of degradation of the environment in the oil and gas sector against Article 39 on the right to a clean and healthy environment. Issues of marginalized groups, Dr. BK, there is a time, I remember, when Professor Loko Nyango was director, when we wrote those working papers on sex workers, on rights of the elderly, sexual rights of the elderly, access to malaria treatment, so many issues within the social, economic, and cultural arena. Because when we talk about only the violations of civil and political rights, we do not forget, we should not forget these egregious and serious violations of social economic rights. I was reading an, an Oxfam report. Over about 10% of Ugandans control about 40% of the income of this country. That is a serious thing. We must interrogate these issues further. How much is going to classify this expenditure, military expenditure, to the detriment of these social economic services like access to health care? How much is going to this parliament, parliamentarians, the bloated administration, the RDCs, the presidential advisor? So to me, 
the young men and women who are here, there are students here. These are issues we need to interrogate. It's unfortunate that the DVC has gone. But you can see everybody's talking about the toxic environment. I thank that student who has challenged us here as lawyers. Can we challenge the constitutionality of the 2022 student statute in court as being unconstitutional? That's a very big challenge. It's not on among you students. We have a Makere University Professors Forum. At times, I post there something, or someone posts something, and everybody keeps quiet. <laughs> Today morning, yesterday, Professor Bachminga posted a, qu a comment on this letter you have been seeing where the president is directing, is directing the, the, his wife, the Minister of Education, to divert land belonging to Makere University to, to what? To, to, eh? to, to, the, to the Baruri. Eh? And Professor Wachminga posted and said, that, does this fall within the policy mandate of the Minister of Education? And the Vice Chancellor replied eh, that this, that the Minister, I hope Professor Wachminga you have said that, that the Minister, the President is talking through the Minister, eh? Do you know what I said? Eh? Out of fear? True. <laughs> eh? You know? It's very unfortunate. We need you to come out. There's one, I'm going to finish. There's one time when students, when the government, when the government, the government deployed military leaders, military people here, soldiers, you remember? I don't know whether you remember that time when they deployed military soldiers here, soldiers, security people, they even occupied Rumumba, Rumumba Hall, Mary Stewart Hall. I talked to a number of colleagues, saturated information on the WhatsApp. What do we do? People kept quiet. And I, there was that language of fear. Then I said, I prayed over it and I said, Professor Ben, eh, within your language, my language, they say, I don't beseech you because I don't eat in your own home. I woke up and I staged a one-man strike. I said, today I am not going to teach because of this deployment of soldiers going back to the mean era and the thing went all over. I was called human. And you worried about the job? I said, I have reached a point of no return. This thing cannot go ahead. This climate of fear, as I conclude, is not among the students only, it's among the students. I, cra I crave that time of the Mujajus. When I delivered my professorial inaugural lecture in 2017, I think that is the last controversial maybe <laughs> lecture. The, whole, the main hall was full, and I was analyzing the politics of maternal health care. And I gave the reasons and the attribution, or most of these were attributed to government misallocation of resources. Because my argument was that it's not a matter of lack of resources that government cannot provide maternal health care services. It's a question of corruption, misallocation of resources, aggrandizement, kleptocracy, rent seeking, patronage, etc. And one of the solutions a social democratic revolution against the government and overthrow it. Oh my God, I received a multitude of calls. And I said, my God, you are the one in charge. Thank you very much. Uh, clearly, like I said, everyone is living in fear except the gentleman over there. Um, let's take this opportunity to welcome uh, Prima Birunji with a round of applause as she makes her presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am going to pe perform a sowet. Um, is soem. Soetry is song plus poetry. And it's a mode of advocacy away from just singing or music or just poetry. So it's 
an amalgamation of that of that too. Yeah, enjoy. <laughs> of this constitution and allow me to take the role of the ones it was framed for. when you form this constitution. Come on, let's contrast it with how deep in a crisis this nation is and is. And now, come with me. Come with me and take our history in your right hand and take the oppressions and the cries for liberation in your left. See how little the strides see, how little the footsteps are. Would you come with me into a world of reflection? Okay, so now let's go into the future. Come with me now. Allow your mind to wander into the future. In two years, this constitution will be 30 years. 30 years of the very demons you, the framers, thought I, the one that it was framed for, would not be fighting today. 30 years of crawling, 30 years of chasing, of hoping, and we are almost still in the same place. today we're here to take two steps one in front of the other and we've often heard that we are all time travelers slowly turning and turning and turning into the future and so it's often been asked why aren't we all working together to make it a future we all want to live in here we are today taking a step one in front of the other one rebuilding we are rebuilding and so today we are not just building for ourselves but for our children and their children thank you very much Uh, thank you so much, Prima, for that. Prima has a really beautiful voice. I wanted to sing an appreciation, but I'm self-aware, and I also live under fear <laughs> that <laughs> I may be judged. Thank you so much for that. Now we can move to the replies to the different insights that we had in the beginning. Allow me to invite the doctor once again to, you know, start with the replies. Okay, uh, with guidance, we shall start with Mr. Nicholas, and then we shall move to the doctor. Thank you. Of, 
Let me first apologize to my professor, Dr. Shokoro. I didn't see you. I'm sorry I missed you. You know, you used to be much chubbier than that, so. <laughs> I guess uh, <laughs> I couldn't notice you. So my sincere apologies. I really would have stepped out of the vehicle to greet you. For a moment, I feared that this was going to degenerate into your expression of grievance against the university. I noticed that from the very beginning. I thought it would take away the limelight from celebrating Uripec and launching the five-year project that Uripec has undertaken to run. So let me first just drive it back to the purpose of this meeting to say we are celebrating Uripec, its achievements. We are challenging Uripec that they, could, they can do much better in contributing to the development of our country. That for me, I think, was the core of the discourse this morning and this afternoon. The task that Uripec has undertaken is a difficult one. And you can hear in this room why it is difficult. Fear. I talked about walls, the actual wall around the university and the wall uh, that you can't see metaphorical wall. I think that you must break down that wall. You must challenge that wall. You must challenge the culture of fear. I'll, I'll give you my own personal story. And again, Professor Shokoro taught me the law of contract. And one of the things I remember vividly in our class at UCU was that because it's a Christian university, were prohibited from talking about sex. And you can trust the good professor when he saw the vice chancellor walking across the class window, he would jump up and talk about sex <laughs> in a very excited manner. One time he even hurt his foot while he was jumping because he wanted to challenge authority. He wanted to say, we can do much better as a university. We can do much better as a school. I saw my other teacher, Dr. Rose Nakai, working at some point. They taught us administrative law, that you must challenge authority where you think an injustice has happened. And so the challenge for Makere University students is to overcome your fear and challenge the authorities in a lawful and respectful manner. The very first protest at UCU was led by myself in 2001. The reason for our strike was the university was dismissing girls, ladies who got pregnant, if they were not married, regardless of how old you were. We refused to accept the policy. We began by leading a protest at the National Council for Higher Education. We went to the Minister of State for Higher Education. We went to the House of Bishops. When all these guys couldn't listen to us, we led a demonstration at the university. We were not violent. We didn't destroy properties. We simply shouted at the Vice Chancellor. <laughs> we did. He was, he was a white man. He's called Noel. I remember him turning pink and sweating from his long nose. And he was forced to amend the policy of dismissal and replace it with a policy of one year maternity leave to go and give birth and you come back. We challenge authorities. The very reason I, ref I failed to study here, when I went to UCU, they increased the tuition fee. They increased our tuition fee from 600,000 shillings to 1.2 million shillings. We refused to accept the increment and brought out our admission letter and said, the university has a contract with us. This is the contract, the law of contract that Shokoro had taught us. And we held the vice chancellor hostage in his office until 10 p.m. in the night and forced him to issue a circular saying the law school was exempt from paying the increment in tuition fees. <laughs> So I finished law school paying 600,000 shillings a semester because we refused to accept what we thought was an unjust policy. So the challenge to you is to overcome your fear 
and challenge the authority. It is sad to hear that at a university, even professors live in fear. I think that that is a tragedy for the country because this is the only place where you can test your ideas, however unpopular the idea is. So challenge the authorities, do so lawfully. I think somebody now, when he came, talked about riots. Protests are not synonymous to riots. Riots are different things, and we all condemn riots, but you have a right to protest. You have a right to protest. The people who have built this country, who are leading it now, as students were engaged in student activism. Many of them were dismissed from this university. Dr. Olara Tonu was dismissed from this university, ran away out of the country, because he led a challenge against the regime of Idi Amin in this country. If you read President Museveni's works in his days in uh, Dar es Salaam, he was engaged in student movement. In fact, for him, it was even guerrilla movements because they wanted to challenge what they saw as unjust. So you must do the same now as they did back then, because if you don't, somebody else will shape the future for you. The emphasis is be lawful, use all available means. There are three guild presidents of this university, two of whom were dismissed by this university because they led protests. We led the court case to challenge the university to reinstate them. Ivan Bowe, if you recall the story of Ivan Bowe. He stood up for his rights. And so you must be willing to challenge the university and pay the cost for it if you can. Because that is the only way you're going to, uh, to challenge, you know, the fear that you have. This suspension by WhatsApp is not a sign of strength. It's a sign of fear. They also fear you. But if you also fear them, then you're all in fear. I think you must challenge challenge the university in every, uh, at every opportunity you have to make sure that the policies the university is enacting uh, respects and promotes the rights of students. Somebody asked me and said, what shall we do if we are being let down by our leaders? There are one or two things you can do. You can live as a ship and comply with unjust laws and, and let it define your life. That is the easier path. You comply. You, you, you don't want to challenge authority. You say, who am I? I'm weak. I need to study. I need my job as a professor. That's the easier route, and anybody can take that route. But the difficult route is to stand up against injustice, even when you think you're going to pay the ultimate price. I spent my four years at the university under threat of dismissals because every single year we were protesting against something we thought was wrong. The second example I'll give you of what we led at UCU was as law students who are required to study the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we said no to hell with it. We are competing with students from other law schools who are studying the law. So we challenged the university to take that course unit to the National Council for Higher Education. If it's approved, we'll study it. But if it is not, we'll not. And so we demanded for a refund of the charges that were levied on our tuition fees for Old Testament and New Testament teaching. <laughs> when they refused to give us our refunds, we went to the office of the university bursa and carried away his keypad. We said, you won't type on your laptop or on your desktop if you don't give us our money. We were refunded our money in tuition credits. We challenged the authorities. And for that, we were almost dismissed. But we weren't dismissed because we were doing the right thing and doing it lawfully. And so, please take it as a challenge. Challenge authorities. Question convention. If you don't question convention, that is what is going to determine your life. Somebody talked about influencers and people who shape people's minds. Sometimes if you follow me on Twitter, you see the amount of vitriol that comes your way and the insults people levy at you. There are two ways to deal with it. The first is that you, you can make humor out of it because most of these guys behind Twitter spaces 
are really people who in real life you can't talk to them. And I'll tell you one way in which I dealt with one who has since stopped insulting me on Twitter. He came to me and accused me of being gay. Now, I didn't deny it or confirm it. I only offered to him that if he wasn't careful, I would make him my stepson. <laughs> and he's never come back to abuse me. I challenged him, I pushed back, I used humor. So social media is a space in which you can actively participate, but you must know what spaces you get involved in. The new media is here with us, it's not going to go anywhere. In the last election, we were able to trace using technology, locations, geolocations of bot accounts that were being used for misinformation. And you will be surprised where those bot accounts were found in the GICC, the Government Information Center. The result of which was all those accounts were closed uh, by both Twitter and Facebook. And perhaps that's the reason up to now Facebook has been closed in this country. And so you can use other tools to be able to get your conversations going to influence people as well in your spaces. Don't run away from it, take part in it. I think those were all the questions I had, but let me say this in closing, that sometimes you should never worry about being unpopular. Never worry about being unpopular. If you believe very strongly in an idea, many of the things we do are very unpopular. I've had family members disown me you know, and say, you're no longer part of our family because you do A, B, C, D. But because we don't believe in popularity, we pursue those ideals religiously, quietly, persistently, that even if you are disowned by your own family, you're able to stay on course and keep your eye on the crystal ball. So you must have an idea that defines who you are and if you find that idea, pursue it relentlessly, regardless of what other people might say about you. In the end, you might be vindicated. I hope that that's a challenge you will take and that when you leave this law school, you don't just go and get lost in the corporate world making money for other rich people, but that you will do something to make sure that your communities are better, your society is better, and indeed your country is more democratic and free. I thank you very much. Thank you for those remarks. Uh, those are very encouraging words and touching. Uh, at this moment, I will call the director Hiripek, who will also give his remarks, introduce to us the new project by Hiripek, and also lead us through the launch. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Geoffrey. I know uh, your patience is wearing thin and we will not test it much longer. Just to... When I grow up, I want to become... I want to be like Nicholas. Uh, hopefully sometime soon, huh? Because we... I think you've had an example here of what true courage looks like. I must confess I'm not very courageous myself. Sometime in 2008, when I just returned uh, from graduate study, I went looking for jobs. I had a young family. My son was, I think, two years old at the time, or three. So I, had, I needed money. So one of the places I went to was the law faculty at UCU. Now, there was a form I had to fill. I was supposed to teach in international trade at the Department of Economics. So part of the form was that, number one, are you married? No, I wasn't at the time. Number two, do you have children? I realized it was a trap. <laughs> <laughs> I realized that my answer to number two may jeopardize <laughs> chances of securing the, uh, the bag, as you, as you people say. Huh? So to my, to my shame, I haven't told my son this yet, to my shame, Answer number two, I said, no, 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 <laughs> no children, no children. <laughs> in the end, I was not, in the end, the deal did not go through because they were a bit unclear as to payment terms. They told me, you know, here we put grace before the law, you know, because I'm asking how much am I going to be paid and when, and then they said, look, there's going to be 
here we put grace before at that moment my deals required hard cash uh, grace not too much so somehow that that project never quite worked um i think today it's 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 we have done what we wanted to do, which was to reflect on the UPEC journey over the, third, the past 30 years and to begin to think about what you can do better. And, and I think some of those came out. Uh, some of you are asking, okay, outside law school, I think Atai, um, or the students who are asking, say, what about us? You're talking about the rights of Ugandans, but what about us? And I think those are legitimate concerns. Um, Prof. Ben mentioned the reality about a, a culture also, and it's true. There's an, it's a, it's a growing culture of silence and apathy at the school, at, at, the, at the university, in terms of lecturers being scared, and in fact, even at the School of Law, I will not lie. There are real challenges. So the challenges of recommitment, of rediscovery of courage, um, it's not a call to some abstract entity outside, it's a call to every one of us here. Now, at the same time, I'd like to, um, because we've talked about the Huripec journey, but Huripec is a department in the School of Law. In that sense, it's embedded within and it's an integral part of the school. So it's one of the five departments. And to this end, I'd like to pay tribute to colleagues at the School of Law, of course, starting from the Deputy Director, Dr. Zahara, but also our senior colleagues here, uh, Professor Bachivinga, who taught us, uh, who taught me contract law, equity and trusts, um, and, and as I'm sure has taught a number of people here, Dr. Rose Nakai, uh, who taught me land law, but also is one of the previous directors of Huripec, Dr. Sylvie Namwase, a valued colleague, and uh, one who has been really behind, the energy behind some of the projects of Huripec, including the SPD, it's described in the flyer that you have, and also one of the new projects we have under Chaco. And I think uh, Dr. To be Emmanuel Kawesi is a beneficiary of that, as, as we all are in the sense in, in terms of that. Professor Ben Tinomgisha has taught a number of us, taught me contract law also, and I benefited from that. And I think we're one of the pioneer classes of health and the law. I, I sat in that class and I, was, I benefited from it. Dr. Anthony Kakosa, um, head of department commercial law, and also a very good friend of Huripec and was, uh, really an inspiration for us. I'm, He's really someone you can count on. Dr. Karen and Lodge has left. I, I don't know if there are any other uh, law school colleagues. It's exams on, on Monday, so it's a difficult time, and some have been teaching, I know, this morning, and some are teaching on Zoom. It's a bit of a crazy week, but uh, we, we appreciate them all. Of course, also our Huripec people. I've mentioned uh, Dr. Z, Dr. Zahara several times, uh, but also the couple of colleagues. Um, and some of them must have been outside or might be milling around. Maxine, um, Roger, our, Maxine Tujuke, our administrator, Roger Musungu, our accountant, uh, Muami Haruna Kanabi, a valid member who, who has done a lot of significant work with us and for whom we are most grateful. Godwin, uh, I saw him, uh, but he's also, I think, uh, uh, doing a lot of the legwork. Uh, Maggie, and quite a number of people there. For a long time until I think yesterday or two days ago, Aunt Millie, whom you all know, uh, the Huripec Fellows Program, those are people engaged in research. Uh, Geoffrey Obo is the pioneer in that sense. The Intern Program with uh, Praise, Aloy Kin, who is doing excellent work there. The Visiting Fellows, such as Dr. Ni uh, Dr. To be Nicole Nicholson. We, it's, it's, I am excited about the, the, both what Huripec was, what Huripec is and what Huripec is becoming. For I'm, I'm personally excited about the past, the present, and really the future. And on the point of the future, oh, before I go there, let me thank Alice Namale. Is she around? Is she still around or she has run away for another class? Yes, Alice, that was a powerful poem. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, Prima Birunji, that was a powerful poem. I, I got it right, I hope. Makere has got talent, huh? and I'm sure there have been other talented people here, so. Uh, John Mary, he has gone away. The, the porridge, the porridge night really should come back. Huh? Uh, it's it's required so that this talent is not lost. Yeah, John Mary is there. Thank you very much for that. Let let, let porridge live. Eh? The porridge night should be fought for and realized once again. Speaking of of the future, and in response to um, uh, this is sort of a response to one of the questions as to okay, 
in a Uganda where you, we have, everyone recognizes that the constitution is broken, the country is sort of run down. We had a minister of justice who promised strong reforms and then somehow the Constitutional Review Commission was supposed to happen, didn't quite happen. Then we had, it's going to be the Luganda Law Reform Commission, but that's not quite happening. Then we have seen a bill that proposes an increment in judges. An effort on, on that part, but clearly, it seems there's a, a lack of will somewhere on the part of the executive. But Uganda really is bigger than a few people who seem to have held it hostage. And the idea behind the reconstituting Uganda project is informed by the understanding that Uganda was here before them and will be here before after them. And that in a sense, it's also about reading ourselves of the fear the fear that comes when you've been with the, a strange situation for a long time, in which what is strange becomes normalized, and that you even fear to think. So it's about rediscovering the courage of thinking in the first place, to, to ask Ugandans to, in spite of, in spite of all conditions, the contrary, that discourage thought. Uh, the president one time said, members of parliament, you should be silent as long as you wake up and vote I. No, it's an invitation to sleep. And so the Reconstituting Ghana project is a rejection of that invitation to sleep. It is uh, an affirmation of citizenship, an affirmation that Uganda is ours and we're here and we, we can think about how to make it better beyond cosmetic reform. So really that's the idea behind Reconstituting Uganda. And to that end, the agenda has started. I actually hesitate to call it a project. It's, it's more of a, an agenda because projects are life are, are based on cycles and they end if if support doesn't come. Oh, speaking of, uh, Nicholas was very generous when I contacted him about two weeks ago to assist with this. He was like, I'll come. And that was, I was deeply grateful for that. But he also said, please feel free when you send the email to ask for some support. And chapter four, we'll see uh, what you can do. And I, I, I was tempted, but then I said, but I, at this moment, you guys will survive with just some soda and some snacks, isn't it? By now, you'd be enjoying a buffet. Huh? Uh, unfortunately, you know, we cut it down. But I'm, but I'm gratified, uh, Nicholas, that the offer was made. And maybe I'll be taking you up on that a few weeks from now. I'm, I'm really gratified by that offer. The, this agenda of Reconstitute Uganda is about starting with what we have. Uh, starting, starting with what you have, immediately do the work that must be done. And to that end, I'm glad that we already have seven, no less than seven, LLD candidates that have gotten on board with this program. One is one a person you, that is quite familiar uh, to all of you here. I don't think he's here today. He must be traveling. Uh, Mr. Ernest Kalibala. The other is, yes, this uh, clapping is, is encouraged. The other is Mr. Godias Durasingura, and this is no particular order. The other is Mr. Emmanuel Achidri. Did he make it today? Uh, he's, he teaches. Oh, Emmanuel, please, please come and join your colleagues here. Please, by all means. He's, uh, Godias uh, is, works with the rule of law program at the Uganda Law Society, and so it's, it's a natural fit. Uh, Mr. Emmanuel Achidri is an alumnus of our school here, but is also teaching at the moment at Uganda Matters University uh, with uh, our former colleague, uh, Professor Frederick Joko. A pleasure to have you. Um, Council Francis Tumwesije is also in the program and uh, one of the LLD students, yes, incoming. Jackie Bukai, did she make it? She works with the legislative drafting department at Parliament. Honest Baguma, yes, Honest, yes, here with us. And last but not least, Dennis Kakembo. Uh, Honest works with the Electoral Commission. Uh, Dennis Kakembo is a partner with Crystal Advocates. And this responds, in a sense, to the idea about, okay, social economic rights. Because you, you can see the incoming LLD candidates cut across. And the idea is to look at each and every part of the Constitution, to leave no part unturned. And the Constitution deals with human rights, yes, but it also deals with finance, it deals with traditional leaders, it deals with public accountability. From chapter one to chapter 19, it deals with the whole gamut of, of the entire life of the human being. And so the work, is going to start. I dare say the work has started. 
I must mention uh, Mr. Emmanuel Kawesi, I already mentioned you before, so I don't feel left out uh, with, with, the, with the Chaco project. I remember in his interview for the Chaco project, he said, oh, by the way, I'm so invested in Chaco that I actually, I burnt Chaco before, you know, I said, okay, this is the guy who, who knows the issues. So, Nicholas, that is, the, that is the agenda that we're asking you to launch today. Those are the first, um, um, you know, somewhere in the Bible it says you rejected the Old Testament. Did you also refuse the New Testament, whatever? Somewhere in the Bible it says the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. And it's true, the work to be done around Uganda and around the Constitution is a lot. We have started with these few, and the idea is that let's start with these few laborers and then work to, 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 to raise a critical mass. So uh, I'd like to bother you at this stage, uh, Nicholas, um, that you'd come and uh, flag off the reconstituting Uganda project, and that will then be followed with by some photographs here, and then departure will be at leisure. I know a lot of you have a lot, some a lot of uh, preparation for the exam to, to be doing. Nicholas, uh, if you don't mind, thank you very much, everyone, for, for coming. I think I'll invite the 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 LLD candidates to come and join us here. LLD to be because the board must first sit and formally, uh, f formally accept you. But uh, the prospective LLD candidates, please come as we launch this project. They are up there, yeah, they are, they are up. <laughs> Pros prospective uh, LLDs, yes. Please come and join us here. Um, uh, Nicholas is asking where the women LLDs, the, the female um, LLD Jackie Bukai did make it this time, but also the, the well, we shall have that discussion. There are still more places. Definitely, it's not a good look, true, huh? but we shall work on that also. I thought you'd say some of this identify as female. <laughs> this, is, this is a huge task. Dr. Z, would you please bring some color and grace to this team? First, let me congratulate my colleagues in the practice of law and the teaching of law on their prospective admission to the LLD program under this program. I know them individually, some of whom we have done cases with. Uh, Mr. Ateji and I are still in court together, involved in a controversial case. I think you have a very good lot of LLD candidates. Crystal Advocate, Mr. Kakembo, is known as a tax expert. His writings are now authority, so you can imagine when he gets his LLD what he will become. It's a very ambitious project. Some might even say controversial. You ask the question, can we actually reconstitute Uganda? Is this a challenge to the nation state as we know it? Is this a process to rethink what constitutes Uganda, what values constitute Uganda, what boundaries constitute Uganda, what ethnic communities constitute Uganda? Can you actually have an organic constitution? Can a constitution be inorganic? These are difficult questions that these individuals are going to contend with. I don't envy you on the task ahead of you. I wish you well. I hope that uh, uh, you won't get into trouble, you won't be arrested, you won't get into fear, that you will think boldly you think fearlessly and give us ideas that the policymakers can grapple with. I also know that there may not be willingness on the other side to accept some of the new ideas. Doctor talked about Norbert Mao's 
ambition for reforming the constitution and how that is now waning into excuses. These ideas may not be welcome, but as I said before, leaders are like bicycle tires. They respond to pressure, keep the pressure going. At some point, these ideas will be taken up and who knows, they might be the ideas that will lead this country to a better place. So by the gracious power and authority granted to me by the director, the acting director, I must add, of the Human Rights and Peace Center, I take this privilege to launch this project and wish you the very best in the next five years. There's no, there's no ribbon to cut. There's no ribbon to cut, so we'll just wave and tell you guys good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicola San. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us today. Um, we hope to, to, to be a part of you in the weeks, months, and years to come. Asante Nisana. Cheers. Um, photo moments now, uh, under the guidance of our uh, moderators. Departure at leisure. Thank you very much. Stuff? Okay, uh, we have some Europec staff, Europec academic staff, please. Shouldn't we pull this out? Academic staff of Europec, please join for the photo. Okay, so we just have one picture. All right, how about will we have the space? Just one. No, I don't know I Pamela. See na balu balu baby. Na umba mi na wetu e. Na chana damu na na dale. See na balu balu baby. Na umba mi na wetu e. Hey, 